Last week, this is a this is a point of doctrine that you really, really, really have to understand because this is where the rubber meets the road. This is the difference between us and everybody else. Let me read this to you. I found this off of a site. I don't even know what the site was, but it was something that I found. I looked at it and I thought, oh, I can use that. And then I printed it and never bothered to save the site, so I don't know where I got it from. But anyway. It says, there was once a minister's meeting in Toronto when a scholar addressed them. He claimed that there was a spark that was present in every single person and that it was the duty of ministers to fan it into life. There was a fundamentalist preacher there who was bold enough in the question time to challenge this interpretation. He used scripture very skillfully and comprehensively to present its own verdict on man. He expostulated with the speaker, didn't he know that man was dead and trespasses in sins, that he was born in sin and from the womb he went astray telling lies, that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, that in his flesh dwelt no good thing, that none seek after God, that the leopard cannot change his spots. He said, and this so-called spark of goodness doctrine is not only a myth, it's a lie. It gives man confidence in himself. It dethrones God and exalts man to be the captain of his soul. It was very well done and all of us would have said amen to his words. Then the modernist got up to respond, I commend you, he said, on the response and your knowledge of many scriptures. I have only one question. Do you believe that man has the ability in himself to either accept or reject the gospel of Christ when it's presented to him. Why, of course I do, said the fundamentalist. Right, said Mr. Liberal. Well, that is this, that, what is this ability in man that gives him this power? And the Arminian fundamentalist looked a bit puzzled as he replied, well, it's man's free will. The modernist smiled and said, exactly. You call it free will while I call it a spark of goodness. You say that we should do all we can to get man to exercise his will to make a decision, and I say we should fan the spark into a flame. Regardless of all you said in your statement, we both agree that the determining factor in becoming a Christian is man's own power of choice. And we're giving, and we, we've both got to do the best we can in inducing him to do whatever. You see, this is true. This is, really is true. If you don't want God's doctrine, then it doesn't matter what church you go to. Pick the one you want. There's 1,200 and different, 1,250 different flavors of exactly the same thing out there. Ben Mott used to say if he didn't believe what he believes, he'd be a Catholic because it's prettier. And he likes Gregorian chanting. You don't want God's doctrine? Go pick one. You like the way the Presbyterians do it? Go join them. You want to be a fundamentalist Baptist? Go join them. Pentecostal? It doesn't matter. Go pick one. There's not a whit bit of difference between any of them. They all believe that you're saved by works. Every single one. One might say it's a spark. One might say it's free will, but they all believe it's man's choice. Now I want you to remember something. There was a lie that Satan told Eve in the Garden of Eden. We looked at it last week. A lot of people don't give that lie enough credence. What was it that Satan said? Ye shall not surely die. That was the lie. 
And what is it that all those churches say? You did not surely die. When Adam ate, he didn't really die. Oh, he became inclined to sin, or he did this, or he did that. But he still has enough within himself to do something like believe or something else that will gain him favor with God. He didn't really die. That was the lie that Satan told the woman in the Garden of Eden. And that is the lie that's been pre being preached from 99% of the pulpits this morning. Sinner, there's nothing you can do. All you have to do is. Roll that over in your mind five times. There's nothing you can do. All you have to do is. How many churches are preaching that this morning? Nothing you can do. All you have to do is believe. Nothing you can do. All you have to do is take this sacrament. Nothing you can do. All you have to do is. You see, they believe that they did not surely die. That we did not surely die as a result of what Adam did in the Garden of Eden. And that word surely means certainly, infallibly, or undoubtedly. That's what surely die means, and that's what God said. Ye shall surely die. And that's why we have this doctrine of total depravity. And that's why, if you don't understand this one, the rest of it doesn't make a lot of sense. But when you understand this one, all of the rest of the pieces fall just fall into place. It couldn't be any different. This is the fundamental one that you've really got to wrap your heads around. Okay? Now last week we looked at total depravity from the standpoint of its, um, let me look at it real quick, its nature and its extent. This week we want to look at sin and its effects. What sin does to fallen man. How, I mean we already decided that it killed him and that man, fallen man is dead spiritually speaking. Alright? So don't lose sight of that. But let's look at their position this idea that well you could do something there's enough of a spark or there's enough free will or there's enough within you that you could do something to gain righteousness with God and the first place I want you to look is Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6 and this is a proof text you want to underline this one and highlight it and put neon signs pointing to it Isaiah 64 and verse 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. That's as far as we need to go for this morning. All our righteousnesses. Our righteousnesses, our good works, the things that we do in order to gain righteousness with God, all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, then what must our sins be? If our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, then what about our unrighteousnesses? In the Hebrew, this word actually translates what, what would be referred to as menstrual flux or the the how's a how's a nice easy way to say this tampons maybe maybe used tampons those are the filthy rags that we're talking about on the day of judgment try this and let's see how it works on the day of judgment when you're standing before the almighty and he says what do you got for me pull out a big trash bag full of used cotexes and pour them on the table and say there you go that's what I got because that's what your works are worth to him not a very pretty picture but it makes the point because that's exactly what that word is talking about I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 20 Revelation chapter 20 we're gonna look at verses 13 through 15 right at the end of the chapter and this is at that judgment that we're referring to we don't need to read the whole passage but at verse 13 it says and the sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them and they were judged every man according to their works now this is important I want you to see what happens to those that are judged 
according to their works. You see, there's a couple of books up there. One of them is the Book of Life. If your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you won't be judged according to your works. You will be judged according to Jesus Christ's works. If you are in, if you're in Christ, then when God gets ready to judge you, he looks at Christ. Because you have nothing to bring to God. But Christ does. But if your name isn't written in that book, you will be judged according to your works. Now, what did we just look at what your works are worth? As much as a used Kotex? The sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Every one that is judged according to their works is cast into the lake of fire. That's hell, folks. If you think that you want to get into heaven based on your works, this is where you're going. Everyone that's judged according to their works is cast in the lake of fire. No exceptions. None whatsoever. So we've seen what your works are worth. Turn over to Psalm chapter 39 and verse 5. And let's look at some other passages that teach what our moral worth is before a righteous God. And let's remember what they were saying about the the spark or the free will or the little bit of goodness within everyone that will lift them up. Psalm 39 and verse 5, Behold, thou hast made my days as an handbreadth, and mine eyes is as nothing before thee. Verily every man at his best state Every man at his best state is altogether vanity, totally worthless, completely valueless. At your best state, not at your worst, at your best state, when you're trying to do your best, it's vanity, altogether vanity, totally and completely worthless. Look at Isaiah chapter 40 and verse, verse uh, 22. Isaiah 40 and verse 22. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers. That's interesting, isn't it? The circuit, the circle of the earth. When did man used to think that the earth was flat? Yeah, up through the time of Christopher Columbus. 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, right? And people thought that he'd fall off the end of the, fall off into whatever you fall off into out in the middle of the ocean because the earth was flat. And yet, prophet Isaiah knew that it wasn't. Look that word up in a Hebrew dictionary and see what that says. You see, God always knew that the world, world was a globe. His prophets knew that too. But science didn't know it. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. Who was it that came up with the idea with the, the fact that the heavens are expanding? Was that Einstein? No, it was God. It's written right here in the Bible. The fact that the universe has always been expanding. Science just now caught up with that. Not that long ago. God's always known it. It's always been hidden right here in the book. If you just paid attention to the book, you would have known that. You see, he's right when it comes to science, too. He understands it pretty well. I think he invented it. But we are as grasshoppers. Well, what's a grasshopper? a bug. 
It's a bug. That's what the inhabitants are. You know, I've, I've referred to that other verse, I don't remember where it is right now off the top of my head, the one that says that he has, it's, it's condescending for him to even to look at what goes on in heaven and in earth. We're nothing to him. He doesn't need us. He really, I hate to tell you this, folks, but he's not going to walk around the rim of hell crying for eternity because us worthless creatures didn't accept him. We have no value before him other than what he gives us. Turn over to Psalms chapter 22. Psalms 22 and verse 6. For David says, but I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. A worm. And in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 17, right back to where we were just a minute ago. Isaiah 40, 17, all nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him less than nothing in vanity. Less than nothing. What's less than nothing? I guess I could draw a zero on the board and that would be nothing, right? And if I erase it, that's less than nothing? All nations combined, the United Nations, everyone combined are worth less than nothing. And not only that, man in his sinful state is not loved by God. He's actually hated by God. Look at Psalms chapter 5. We keep hearing preachers talk about how God loves everyone and how God is love. And is that what the Bible says? Does the Bible teach that God loves everyone? No, it doesn't. It actually teaches that God hates everyone. Unless you are in Christ Jesus and you are one of His, God doesn't love you, God hates you. He hates you enough to be willing to send you to hell for eternity. That doesn't sound like somebody that loves you very much. Psalm chapter 5 and verse 5. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight, thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing, that means lies. The Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. Abhor. That doesn't sound like love, does it? If you abhor someone, that doesn't sound like you love them very much. Look at Psalm chapter 10 and verse 3. That verse says that, that, the, um, that he hates all workers of iniquity. Well, by nature, we're all workers of iniquity. Every single one of us. Last week I asked for a show of hands of how many people had told a lie in their life. That's an iniquity. Every hand should have gone up or you're telling another one. We've all done it. We've all sinned. We're all workers of iniquity. Every single one of us. And our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. So in Psalms chapter 10 and verse 3, For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire, and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. Whom the Lord abhorreth. Psalms verse 11 and, or chapter 11 and verse 5, The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked, and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. You see, God doesn't love the wicked. There's a passage over in Romans chapter 9, For Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Now I know that there are a lot of people that will say, well, what that really means is, see, hate doesn't really mean hate, it means that he loved him less. Well, there is a sense in which the word hate does mean to love less. Look it up in a dictionary, you'll find it. But it's not the primary meaning. It's a secondary meaning. And we spent several weeks at the beginning of this showing you why you base your decisions on primary meanings, not on secondary meanings. 
is there a passage anywhere in this Bible that says God loves every human being without exception? No. So there's no re so it doesn't create a contradiction to believe that God hates people. And it doesn't create an absurdity. So why would you go away from the primary meaning? Those are the only times that you do is if it creates a contradiction or an absurdity. And it's not absurd for God to hate the people that he's going to send to hell. And it's not absurd, and it doesn't create a contradiction to believe that when God says he hates somebody, he hates them. The word hate means hate, means to detest. And God doesn't love everybody. He never did. That's another one of those little lies of the same guy that said, ye shall not surely die. Now let's look at another fact. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 13 and verse 23. This is actually one of the verses I think that was that was quoted in the uh, in that article that I read earlier. And this this goes to the point that sinful man is unable to do or to change his nature. Remember that the one of the problems that we have is that we not only have this nature that we're trapped with, the sin nature that we inherit, which produces sins that gets us in trouble again. But our, our nature itself is sinful. And you cannot change nature by the activity of your will. You might be able to change physical, you might be able to quit sinning on this point or that point, but you can't change your nature. You are what you are. You cannot turn into a squirrel. Some people might be squirrely, but they can't actually become a squirrel. You can't change yourself into an antelope. You can't do it. You cannot change your nature by, by your own will. And this is the verse that says it. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. You cannot change your nature just by the activity of your own will. I don't care how hard you will it. A black man cannot turn white by just thinking about it. A white man can't turn black. A white man can't turn into a black woman by wanting to. You cannot change nature by the activity of your will. Well, how then do you change your nature from being sinful by the activity of your will? You don't. Can't be done. On the, on the other side, though, turn to Philippians chapter 2, and let's see, let's see something. Because there are some people who seem different. There are some people that don't seem to be as sinful as others. There are some people that do try to find God, that do seek God, that do try to be holy. Let's see why that is. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13. Well, let's look at verse 12 to get the context. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have also obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It is God that works in you to will and to, to be willing to do what God wants you to do that didn't come from you, God worked that in you. To do of his good pleasure, to quit sinning and try to be righteous, that didn't come from you. That came from God putting it in you. And if God put it in you, well, then you don't fall into this group anymore. Remember, I told you who I'm speaking to here is not, I'm speaking about what we were in the past, not what we are today. Remember what Paul said in Ephesians, and you, or have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. All of us at one time were dead in trespasses and sins. Not anymore if you're a child of God, because God worked in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's where it comes from. It came from God. It didn't come from you. You didn't work that up on your own. 
Not only that, if you turn over to Romans chapter 8, and again, we're talking about man in his fallen state. Romans chapter 8 and verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You cannot please God by being in the flesh. So how can you become a child of God by willing yourself into it? You can't. You cannot please God. As long as you are in the flesh, you cannot please God. Well then, how do you get, how do you please God? He has to act first. He's got to get you out of the flesh. He has to move you out of that category and he has to change your nature. You can't change it yourself. God has to change it. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, brethren, pray for us. This is the Apostle Paul asking the church at Thessalonica to pray for him and those that are traveling with him. That the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. What? You're going to go on a missionary trip and you want to be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men? I thought those were the guys you're out there trying to save. That's what the Arminians would say. You go out into these areas where wicked and unreasonable men live and you convince them to become a child of God so that they're not wicked and unreasonable anymore. It's not what Paul did. Paul didn't want to have anything to do with wicked and unreasonable men. It's hard enough dealing with children of God. Why would I want to deal with wicked and unreasonable men? Notice why this is. For all men have not faith. You see, it doesn't say for all men don't believe, does it? It says all men have not faith. They don't even have the ability to believe. Wicked and unreasonable men can't believe. They don't have the ability to believe. So how could that be the necessary consequence in order to become a child of God? If you, if you have to do that and you can't do it, then how do you get there? You don't. That's not how it's done. It's not at all how it's done. The world is busily sending missionaries to unreasonable and wicked men that don't have faith. Now let's prove this point that wicked and unreasonable men can't, don't, don't possess the components that are necessary in order to have faith. First turn to John chapter 8. Now this is Jesus speaking to some Pharisees. John chapter 8 verse 43. Speaking to the Pharisees, and he says, why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. Now obviously they could hear him, they could hear his voice, they just couldn't hear him with the understanding, they couldn't understand what he was saying. It didn't make sense to him, it didn't sink in, they didn't grasp it. Why didn't they grasp it? They're educated men, the Pharisees weren't idiots, they were educated men, so why did they not understand why he, what he was saying? Why couldn't they get it? Why, didn't it not, why did it not make sense to them? And the explanation is in verse 47. He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. I don't know how it could be any more plain than that. That if you're not a child of God, you cannot understand 
the Word of God. If you don't already possess eternal life, you can't understand the Bible. It doesn't make sense to you. You have to be born again first. So if you haven't been born again, then you're wicked and unreasonable. And so why would Paul want to go to them? He was looking for people that had the ability to understand. Children of God out there that didn't know the truth yet. That's who he was looking for. That's who we're always looking for. People out there that show forth fruit that they could be a child of God. We just need to get the message to them and see if, see if they swallow it or not. See if they have the ability to understand and comprehend it. See if they're able to believe it. That's what we do. Now look at the next point. Look at 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. First Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14 says, But the natural man, now there's a man that's devoid of the Spirit of God, a man that's not born again, natural man, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. You see, he doesn't have the ability to understand them. He can't understand it. You have to have spiritual life in order to understand spiritual truth. And so if someone is not born again, you can go preach to them just like preaching to that trash can over there. You can preach to them for the rest of your life. And that trash can is never going to come down the aisle and get saved. It doesn't have spiritual life. If a man has spiritual life, then this makes sense to him. But if he doesn't, it doesn't matter how long you stand there and preach. It's not going to get through. You're talking to a wicked and unreasonable person. And it, you cannot get through to him. It doesn't matter how long you try. That does not mean that sometime in the future God might change him. But as of right now, you may as well be talking to the trash can because it's not going to get through. They don't have the ability to understand. And that's why Paul prayed to be delivered from them. Deliver us from that type. Not only that, look at John chapter 10 and verse 26. John 10 and verse 26. Well, look at verse 25. Jesus answered them, I told you and you believe not the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not because you chose not to. Is that what your Bible said? No. You believe not because ye are not of my sheep. You see, it's Christ's sheep that believe the gospel. If you're not one of his sheep, you don't have the ability to believe it. Now that does not stop you from believing what's taught in a whole bunch of other churches out there. Because you were born able to believe a lie. Anybody can believe that. Anyone can believe a lie. But believing the truth requires grace. And so if you're able to believe the truth, if you're able to actually look at mankind and see what God sees rather than what fallen man sees, then you possess the ability to understand the truth. But fallen man cannot look at himself apart from the Holy Spirit and see how wicked and evil he really is. He can't see it. That's why so... You know, one of, the, one of the marks that you find of a child of God is that when they do something wrong, they take the blame for it. And yet, watch people in power sometime, and watch what happens when they get caught with their hand in the, in the cookie jar. What do they do? 
exactly what Adam did. They blamed somebody else. It's somebody else's fault. Somebody else did this, or somebody else did that, or it's some other administration, or it's somebody else. Not my fault. They can never find fault with themselves. That's one of the stumbling blocks that keeps them from understanding the truth. When you do something wrong and you realize I did something wrong, that's a good sign. Because most people try to find somebody else to blame it on. Unfortunately, a lot of times even children of God try to find somebody else to blame it on. That's part of your nature. That's part of the fallen flesh that we're hung with that we just can't seem to get away from. And the reason that there's a problem with this, and what this comes all the way back around to, is the fact that we are a dead corpse. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to come all the way back around from where we started last week. Ephesians chapter 2. And you have he quickened, we went over this last week, that means made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. You see, you were dead in trespasses and sins, and it was God that made you alive. Look at verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. You see, the, the way that a child of God becomes a child of God is not by them believing in Christ, or walking down the aisle, or doing any kind of work. The way they become a child of God is that God quickens them. God brings them to life. God changes their heart. And then at that point, they're able to believe. At that point, they're able to understand. At that point, they start to seek God, which they wouldn't have done otherwise. That's what draws them into the church. That's what sends them on the mission to try to find out why I'm here. What am I doing here, and why does everything so, seem so strange? What's wrong with me? Why do I keep bumping into walls? Well, because you're one of the ones that was meant to bump into walls. You're one of the ones that was born again. That's why things seem odd. You know, that's one of the, that's one of the problems that we run into. There's so many people that get into the church, and you, and you sit back and you look at you look at some of the some of the paths that they chose in their life and and you wonder first off how in the world did they ever get through that how did they ever come out of it okay but why were they there in most cases they were looking for something they knew there was something out there but it certainly wasn't going to be found in a King James Bible maybe it's found over here in a bottle maybe it's found over here in something else Maybe it's this pleasure or that. It's got to be so. It can't be here. And then they stumble into this. And lo and behold, there it is right there in the pages of the King James Bible. It was always there. They just didn't know it. And those are the ones that just seem a little different. Why were they different? Because they're children of God. That's why they were different. That's why every time they look back at their life, they and the, the longer... The longer you walk in this life once you've been converted, the more you can look back and see things. You can look back and see why you were in a specific place at that specific moment. Why certain things have happened to you. Why it brought you around. I, I think I talked about this last week, how that, how that you take all of the members of this church and if you just put them in a room, you don't really see these people coming together. But in a church you do. But not just out there in the world, because everyone in here is so different. When you take each of the families and look at them individually, you don't see this as being what would normally come together. And yet it did, because you're family. You're in the family of God. And so God put you together. God arranged it so that all of these different groups of people at that specific time would be searching at the same time and bump into each other. 
You say, well, that doesn't seem like a God that hates us. Again, he doesn't hate you. He loves you. He loves his children. But as for the other bunch out there, not too concerned about them. And there's a lot of reasons why, and we'll get to those reasons later on in this in the study. Not this morning, but later on. Turn also to Romans chapter 8 and verse 6. And we already looked at this passage just a couple of minutes ago. Romans chapter 8 and verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Carnally minded is death. Spiritually minded is life and peace. Do you see the difference? Do you see how the, on the one side the carnal mind, the carnal mind is death, the spiritual mind is life? Carnal mind, that's what you were. Spiritual is what you are. You hath he quickened, you hath he made alive, which were dead in trespasses and sins. And remember that we're dealing with a man that, or woman, that is in essence a corpse when it comes to the things of God. If you were to, if you were to go down to the morgue and open up one of the drawers and slide one of the bodies out that's a dead corpse and plead with that corpse and beg for them to sit up because if you would just sit up I can give you life I just need you to sit up I just need you to come down the aisle if this church was full of a bunch of corpses, if I were standing in a morgue this morning and every one of you were laid out on a slab and every one of you were dead, how long would it take? How many times would we have to sing just as I am to get a few of you to walk the aisle? We'd be here a long time because dead corpses can't get up and walk. But that's what churches try to do constantly because they don't realize that a person that is dead in sins is dead. They are spiritually dead. And once you're dead, you can't breathe life back into them again. They're gone. And that's where that lie falls in, where Satan says you shall not surely die. There's a bunch of churches out there that don't think you surely died. God said you did. And so that's why popular modern religion won't work. And that's why it doesn't matter which one of them you pick. It really doesn't matter. God doesn't care. Pick whichever one you want. They're all wrong. Every one of them teaches that God was a liar Every one of them teaches that when God said you shall surely die, that you really didn't. Every one of them defies what God says, so it doesn't matter which one you pick. Go pick one of them. Pick the one that's closest to the house. The one that your friends go to. The one that's got the best program for the kids. Pick whichever one you want. Because if you don't pick God's church, it's all a lie anyway. Now I know this. We're, we're wrapping this up a lot faster than normal. I'm, most of you know I'm having some issues with my knee, so my mind's really on my knee more than it is on anything else this morning. So I, we're probably going to get done a little bit quick. I hope that's okay. Turn over to Romans chapter 3. This is the Bible's summary of sin and its effects on human nature, on mankind. Now, I want you to remember, again, we're talking about the fallen flesh nature of mankind. Now, unfortunately, even if you're born again, you still have that fallen flesh nature. You're not going to get rid of that until the resurrection. You're stuck with it. 
And that's what creates this warring that you have constantly throughout your life where you know you shouldn't do something and yet you tend to do it anyway. You hear the call and run after it. But this is what the flesh looks like from God's perspective. Not man's. This is not man's perspective. This is God's perspective. This is how God sees things. Man doesn't see this, but God does. And remember, it's his perspective that we have to pay attention to when it comes to this. Romans chapter 3 and verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? He's referring to the difference between Jews and Gentiles here. No and no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. There's not a bit of difference between them. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable, there is none that doeth good, no, not one. Wendy had a conversation with somebody this week and, and they were talking about the differences in churches and I think, the, I think the, the girl finally landed on the idea that we believe in predestination. I think there was that where she, yeah. Oh, you're the bunch that believes in predestination. Well, we believe in predestination as far as what the Bible says about predestination, yeah. It's only mentioned in four verses and only talks about two different things. Um, what she probably really meant was that we believe the doctrine of election, that God chose some and didn't choose others. That's usually what they mean when they say predestination. That's the, I mean, if you continue to ask the questions, that's usually where you end up. Not many people will actually state that they believe in absolute predestination, the idea that God predestined everything to fall out exactly the way that it did. Um, Muslims believe that. It's called fatalism. They believe that, that Allah set everything in, in motion, and so whatever I do, it's not really me that did it anyway. God made me do Allah made me do it. Right? Kind of who was the comedian that Flip Wilson, the devil made me do it? Yeah. Only the opposite. That's what see, this is one of the reasons that Muslims will fly an airplane into a building. Because Allah made him do it. I didn't really do anything wrong. It wasn't me. I'm not a bad guy because I kept, because I wore a car bomb or blew up all these people. I had no choice. It was predestined from before the foundation of the world that at this particular time I would blow up this building. I have no control over it. That's what they believe. That's called fatalism. Many, many uh, Presbyterians believe the same thing. Some primitive Baptists believe the same thing. We don't believe that. We believe predestination from the standpoint of what the Bible says about it. It says that we're predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ, and it says that we're predestined to be adopted as children. That's it. There you have the totality of predestination in the Bible, those two things. And if you look up every place it occurs, you'll find it occurs in four four verses in two different passages, one in Ephesians and one in Romans. That's it, that's the only place it talks about it, and that's all there is to predestination. But what most people think of when they say predestination, they're talking about election. They're talking about the idea that God chose some and didn't choose others. We know Arminians will teach election also. Even, and I know I seem like I'm getting far afield, but I'll wrap this back together again. Even Arminians believe the idea that God elected some. You can't avoid it. It's all over the Bible. If you try to scratch out election, you're going to end up with a very small book in front of you. It's all over the place. So you have to deal with it. But here's how they deal with that. They go over to, uh, to one of the Peters. Here it is, 1 Peter 1, 2. Well, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, 
through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. And so they will say that they believe in election, but that they believe that election is based on foreknowledge. And they'll use this verse. They will use this verse to, to try to say that God foreknew who it was that would accept Christ. And since he foreknew who it was that would accept Christ, he elected them to salvation based on that. And they will use this verse to teach that position. Now, let me ask you a question. Look at the verse. Does it say that? Does the verse say elect according to, the, to, to God knowing that you would accept him? And that's why he elected you? No. It says elect according to foreknowledge and leaves it at that. It doesn't say what the foreknowledge is of. It just says elect according to foreknowledge. Now, foreknowledge is one of, those ver one of those words that there's not that many places that you have to look it up either. And if, you, and if you run all of the verses that say foreknowledge, that tell you what foreknowledge is, in every case it's talking about who the person is, not what the person did. It's talking about the person themselves. God foreknew his children. He knew who his children would be before Adam ate of the forbidden fruit. He had already written their names in the Lamb's Book of Life. He foreknew his people in a way that he doesn't know others. Okay? Now, you say, well, why did you go there? Because I want to show you what, I want to show you something. I want you to keep your hand here on, in Romans chapter 3, and I want you to flip back to Psalms chapter 14. There are two Psalms that David wrote that are almost word for word identical. Psalms chapter 14, and I believe it's Psalms 53. And those are the verses that he's quoting when he taught, when he's over in Romans, when we started to read what we were reading in Romans. Psalms chapter 14 says, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt, they have done abominable works, there is none that doeth good. Now look at verse 2. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. Look at that. He actually did that. He actually did what the Arminians said he did. He actually did it. He did look to see if there were any that, that would seek God, that would accept him, that would understand. He looked. He did look. Look what he found. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. So if you want to take that position that election is based on the idea that God foresaw who would accept him and elected him based on that, then no one was ever elected. Because God did look. And he found none. There were none. Now, that's one reason that I took you to this passage. But here's the other reason. Continue to read this. Verse 4 of Psalms 14. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread and call not upon the Lord? There were they in great fear, for God is in the generation of the righteous. Ye have shamed the counsel of the poor, because the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that the salvation of Israel were come out of Zion, when the Lord bringeth back the captivity of his people. Jacob shall rejoice, and Israel shall be glad. In this passage, David is writing about the enemies of God's people. That's who he's talking about, God's enemies. The enemies of God's people, David is writing about in the Psalms. And Paul takes that very same language and uses it to show that that is also an apt description of us. You see, even us in our natural state are just like the enemies of God's people. Even the members of the church in their natural state are just as bad as the enemies of God's people because prior to the time of your being born again, you were one of the enemies of God's people. 
We're all in the same boat. And the difference is not because of us. The difference is because of God. Back to Romans 3. There's none, none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This is a description of fallen man. This is a description of wicked and unreasonable men. Why would you not pray to be delivered from these kind of folks? You can probably understand why Paul would say, deliver me from wicked and unreasonable men, because this is who they are. And this is what's out there. And the sad part is that this is you under sin. The only difference is that when God creates a new within you, a new heart and a new spirit in the new birth, in the regeneration, then your spirit's different. Your flesh remains the same, but your spirit and your soul are changed. And it's at that point that you start to seek God, but prior to that you don't. Prior to that you're just like this. You were just like this. Now that we now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. You see, this is the Bible's summary of what man looks like under sin. This is how despicable man appears to God under sin. We talked about his righteousnesses being his filthy rags. We read about his mouth being full of cursing and bitterness and feet swift to shed blood. You say, well, I never killed anybody. Well, yeah, but you thought about it. There have been times you thought about it, and if you could have gotten away with it, you might have. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. You know, there's a, there was a, a story that I remember reading one time about And this, talk, this goes to the deceitfulness of sin. You know, we, we read about how sin is very deceitful. And this is a story of a little songbird that, that somehow heard, while he was flying around singing, heard someone say something about worms for feathers. Worms for feathers. That's kind of strange, and so the songbird went down to see what this was all about. But sure enough, there was a guy there that was selling worms for feathers. And he had some of the most beautiful worms that this little songbird had ever seen. Big, fat, juicy ones. And he said, I'll give you two of these worms for one, I just need one feather. One, you give me one feather, I'll give you two of these worms. And the little songbird thought, well, I got lots of feathers. I have never seen worms that look that good before. So he plucks out a feather and gives him a feather and he takes his two worms. Flies off, singing, happy. Well, then all of a sudden the next day he starts thinking about those worms again. How much better those worms were than the worms that he has to go work for on his own. I could, I could afford another feather. I can quit before I run out of feathers. And so, day after day, he keeps going back and getting the fat worms and giving him a feather. Until one day, he eats the worms and starts to fly away and jumps off the table and thud lands on the ground. He can't fly anymore. And he starts thinking, you know, I should have noticed this because I was getting fatter and it was getting harder to fly, but now I don't have any feathers left. I've given up all my feathers. And that's the deceitfulness of sin. And every one of us has this nature that we're still trapped in. 
that once we start to cross that line, it's almost impossible to come back. And we're still stuck with it. We're still prone to it. The difference is God has worked in us the ability to avoid it, where others don't have that. The fact that you can say no, the fact that you know better than to eat the worm and give up a feather, because it takes a long time for a songbird to grow feathers back. You say, well, where are you going with all this? Well, the point being that every one of us still has a nature that we're stuck with that we can't get rid of. We won't get rid of this until they plant us in the ground and then we'll rot and we'll get a new nature in this respect in the resurrection. Every one of us has this, but a, but we also have a nature that's different. But it's not because of us. We don't have a nature that seeks God and tries to do godly things because of anything within us, any more than anyone else did. If all of the rest of the world out there had the same nature, they would be out there trying to seek God and trying to do godly things, rather than being somewhere out there not seeking God. And that's the problem with total depravity. Look around the room. There's not that many. Churches are full. Churches that tell lies are full. But you look around at our little churches and they're just not that big. There's not that many people that are willing to look at their own nature the way that God shines the flashlight on it when he finally comes around and knocks on the door. And sometimes it's so much more attractive, even for people that get involved in the church, even for people that are baptized, even for people that believe, sometimes those worms start to look pretty good and they're willing to give up a feather so that they don't have to go get a worm the hard way. And we have to always remember not to be one of those because we've seen it happen and we're stuck with this nature that we can't get away from. There's nothing we can do about it. And every one of us can fall right back into it again because of this idea of total depravity and the sin and the effect that sin has on each and every one of us and how deceitful it can be and how it can trick us into doing things that we never would have done had we been able to see the end result. And so with that, I close for this morning. I thank you for your kind and patient attention. And I, I hope that as we go forward next week, we're going to look at what the gospel is not. We've covered some of this already. We've already shown in, in many respects how it couldn't be what is commonly taught. But we're going to show it in more detail in the weeks to come. And so with that, I thank you for your kind and patient attention. Let's, let's stand and be dismissed in prayer.